Well, welcome everyone to uh, the second in our week-long uh, series of presentations for National Forest Week. And it's my privilege to uh, introduce this evening. And uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, share the treaty land acknowledgement that we have for the uh, Friends of the Saskatoon deforestation areas. The areas are situated in the West Swale Yorth Island Glacial Spillway, a sacred site in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Those who entered into Treaty 6 are the Mahewa, Cree, Mekawai, and Yankton and Yantoni people. May our relationships with the land Standing peoples, forests and waters teach us to honor and respect the past and invite us to move forward in harmony. May we all come together as friends to find the inspiration and guidance from histories, languages and cultures which broaden our understanding and community collaboration for the present and future. So tonight we have uh, Dr. Colin Leroux. Uh, yes professor at the School of Environment and Sustainability and the Department Head of Soil Science in the College of Agriculture and Bio Resources. The Canadian light source synchrotron and trees both revolve around rings and hidden within it is an abundance of knowledge and the ability to travel back in time for a glimpse into climate history. Very important at this time. Thank you uh, for being with us today. Dr. Laroque, as we find out more about the Mystic Eskiwan Dendrochronology Lab or MAD Lab and the tree program. I'll turn it over to you, Colin. Thank you very much, Robert. Really appreciate it. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, so much and especially for the, um, the welcome and the uh, welcome to the land. So I appreciate that both. I'm Metis and so it means a lot to me when I hear that and uh, the welcome to the land. As you'll see, I grew up here in Saskatchewan in our family farm up in Duck Lake. Um, and so I am I grew up close to the land and that's when I got first interested in trees and the forest. And um, the story I'm gonna share with you tonight is a story that's very similar and very close to my heart in a sense. It's educating young children and young kids about what I love and that's the trees and the forest. And, Hopefully it fits in with your week-long program. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, I have a PowerPoint slide to share with you tonight. Okay, it says that I'm up. Is it all look good on your end? Yes, yeah. it does, thanks. Okay, so what I'm here to talk, is kind of a partnership agreement that we have between the Canadian Light Source and uh, my MAD lab, the tree ring lab. And um, our story starts about, oh, the end of 2015, the beginning of 2016. And um, <clears throat> I was in my office one day, I had just finished lecturing and I came back and I took my lunch out, it was about noon. And I sat at my desk and then the telephone rang. And I picked up the phone and uh, nothing was there. And I said, hello, Colin, you know, and. Uh, there was kind of nothing there. And then I said, hello, Colin, you know, and then all of a sudden I heard this squeaky little voice in the background. And it was actually, uh, I don't know if you'll see my mouse, but it was this guy right here. And he was a grade 11 at the time. And he said, um, do you know what an increment core is? And I stopped and in my immediately in my mind, it's kind of like, you know, when you get one of those prank calls from a little kid, you know, is your refrigerator running kind of thing? And those kind of things. This is, you know, again, I said, beg your pardon? He says, uh, do you know what an increment core is? I said, well, yes, uh, I know an increment core. And for those of you who don't know, it's in my, in my field of tree ring science, it's what we use to go out and we take a small sort of pencil-like sample from a tree without harming the tree. But it's a specialized tool and not everybody has it. Maybe in the forestry world, you'll have them. But this little voice in there said, said, uh, good, uh, do you ever lend them out, you know? And I sort of said, well, sure, uh, who am I talking to? And he goes, well, my name is uh, Derek and I'm from the Looseland Soil Club. So a small town in Saskatchewan, Looseland. 
And we're made up of grade eights and grade nines and all the way up to grade twelves. Uh, we're a small school. And what we're studying is the crooked bush. I don't know if you know about it, but it's out by Hepburn. And uh, it's uh, these aspen trees and they're really crooked and they're growing along and you can go um, in there and, and you can see it. And, and they, people say it's kind of like a mystery, a botanical mystery of why are these trees uh, so crooked? Um, they stopped on a school trip there and they showed them they needed a break and had their lunch. And they looked at them and they said, what a wild kind of forest. And they looked across the road and they saw these nice, straight, classic apps, aspen. So, you know, within a hundred meters across the road, you had these very crooked trees and you had these really straight trees. And they thought, well, that was really weird. But their teacher said, you know, there's this program at the Canadian Light Source, the Synchrotron. There's only one of them in Canada. And what, you know, I can go and I can take this uh, kind of teacher school and then we could go there and maybe we could figure out why these are crooked on one side of the road and why they're straight on the other side of the road. And so they went ahead and they did that and they started progressing along and they were working with the Synchrotron and the education team at the Synchrotron said, you know, you should find somehow so you could sample these trees, but don't hurt them or anything and find out. And there's this guy on campus, his name's Colin Rock, and you can call him up. Here's his number. Maybe he could help you. Maybe he could give you one of these tools and he could give you some information. Well, then that's where my telephone call came in. And so I said, well, sure, I'll help you out. The teacher of their school said, well, I'm coming to Saskatoon this weekend. Could I meet you at Tim Hortons and buy a cup of hot chocolate or tea or coffee or whatever? And then maybe you could share that with me and then t tell me how, what to do, because none of us have ever sampled before. And so that's exactly how it went. We met on the weekend and I lent him some equipment. He went back to the school. The, the kids at the school had a chance to look at the equipment. They phoned me. We talked a bit more on the phone. I tried my best to explain what to do. And then they went out and they sampled. Uh, a few weeks later, they were coming back to Saskatoon and I invited them over to my tree ring lab. And here they are with their samples around the table. And what they want to know were like, how old were these trees? What was different about them? What could I tell them? And so we went through a sort of a, a crash program in the one afternoon and we glued in our cores and we sanded them down and we looked under a microscope and we dated them and they got to see the difference between hardwoods and softwoods and the different structures inside the tree. And so it was they were just fascinated. You know, these are kind of grade eight, nine, 10, 11 students. But what was really impressive about it is they were just they had bought into their entire project, right? Their whole club was there. They were eager to learn. And I just loved that. It was wonderful. And then after that, after we worked in my lab for a few hours, they were taking their very first uh, tour of the Canadian light source. So I got to go over with them. And, um, you know, there we are inside the main hutch of ideas. And this is the beamline scientist, David. And there I am in the corner because I had never been in the synchrotron either. And because I had never been in there, I was kind of like, hey, if you guys can get me in and you can get me off of the, the tour and you get me downstairs on the floor, that was amazing. So I'm gonna, you know, grab their coattails and come along with them and learn what I can. So in we were going and wow, if you've never been in there or the first time you're in there, it's just amazing the kinds of uh, uh, gizmos and gadgets aplenty and we'll get there a little bit more. But here's David, you know, a physicist trying to quickly explain what his equipment can do. And of course, everybody's eyes were just, you know, big eyed and we didn't know what was going on, but it was our introduction. A couple of weeks uh, later, they came back for their beam time. They had a one eight hour shift where they got to run one part of the beam line. And we had never really put trees in before. And so they asked me if I could come along and I did what I had to do and I got a special kind of mentor badge to come in and I got to join the group and I wasn't allowed to touch anything but I could sure watch things. I could see and I could guess and I could help with them. How can we put these uh, little bits of wood into the, uh, into the synchrotron to look at? Uh, how can we mount, for example, the soil samples? They took soil samples and here they are sort of mounting them into sort of a paper clip there and putting them, getting them ready for uh, zapping. But I was right there, I was able to watch uh, as they were learning and I was able to kind of help them or mentor them along without basically telling them 
what I thought, but at the same point in time, I was just, uh, I was, I was hooked. I was in, this was quite the chemistry set that we were able to kind of use. The students did all the running. They did everything. They ran, they drove the sort of uh, beam, they turned it on, turned it off, they zapped, they designed their whole experiment. They would ask questions or chemical questions, or in my case, tree questions. And I would do my best to help them or else point them off in the right directions. But they ran their experiment and it was just, it was wonderful. As the information started to come out and the data started to come out, what I was able to do is to be in the background, looking over their shoulders, pointing things out that I seen. And this is all their data hot off the presses and they were kind of altering their experiment as we went along. And it was wonderful for them to kind of see this and to kind of get uh, hooked on this type of uh, education. They were running probably one of the biggest and most expensive pieces of equipment we have in Canada for a scientific world. And here they are, just a science club from Looseland, Saskatchewan. It was just a wonderful uh, environment to be in. Eventually, after their day, they had to give a talk to the uh, beamline scientists, and they had to talk to the professors and the other uh, doctors and PhDs at the beamline. And then they got their, uh, their merit uh, kind of a, a plaque that they completed the program. You can see how actually a couple of these students have come to university and even this, you know, five, six years ago, they all look so young to me, but you know, there I am in the background kind of, and here's when my grad students came along and there's David, the beamline scientist, but more importantly, we met this woman, Tracy. And Tracy Walker is the education uh, coordinator at the Canadian Light Source. So it was really interesting. And we just kind of hit it off right away. We were very interested in teaching and this was her program that these students were taking place but she had never quite had a mentor like me someone who is there to use another lab on campus and it really worked well usually they just take a tour of it and they run their experiment and they leave but in this case they had access to my tree ring lab at the same time as they had access a few hundred meters away to the cls and so they went back and forth over a couple of days i was there with them throughout watched their presentation help clap and I was there for the kind of send off picture at the end. And it was a really good experience for everyone concerned. And I got so much out of this. What was interesting the most though, is I was actually teaching um, environmental science 110. And this happened in uh, about March. They came to the campus, March, April, and I was teaching next fall. And I was getting ready already for my environmental science 110. It's a first year course. It's an introductory course. And anybody who's ever been to university, you know, they sort of take the tried and true uh, labs and, you know, like the same labs that maybe haven't changed for for years in biology and chemistry and everything. And environmental science was no different. But what I wanted to do is go into this new program called First Year Research Experience or FIRE. I want to try to give more uh, research experience to students in their early years so that by the time they got to their fourth years, they actually knew if they liked it, they might change the kind of courses they took and all kinds of stuff. So Tracy helped me, um, we got into this fire project on campus, but out of that, Tracy and I kind of developed a brand new program. We called it Fire on the Beam Lines. Again, first year research experience, but now we made she made room for 12 of my undergraduate students. So first year undergraduate students, could either opt in and they could take the regular labs or they could take this special kind of lab where they went over and by the end of the term, they were running the, the synchrotron as well. Um, we had maybe 25 people put their name in for these 12 spots. And so we drew out of a hat in the middle of class and we took the 12 people and we put them into this fire program. And it was, again, very successful. Um, again, um, what you see is like examples of, here's a, a young student, Ben, fresh out of high school out of Davidson, Saskatchewan. And bam, by the end of Christmas, he's sitting here on a beam line with an experiment that he and his group have designed and they're running. Uh, something that he dreamed of maybe in his fourth year, he might be able to go in, but you know, here he is in his very first class. And it's really set him up for, now he's, uh, he's in engineering and he's almost done actually. He's just doing a, a a term that's, I forget what they call it, but those special terms in the work placement terms. And then he should be graduated by April. But here he was four or five years ago, 
uh, fresh out of high school, not knowing what he wants to do. But we were able to turn him on to this kind of uh, research and uh, he's a classic researcher without knowing it. Well, as Tracy and I kind of worked, we worked with education students, we worked with environmental science students, uh, we worked with any kind of clubs and groups that kind of applied to her. But we started to think about, you know, Canada's big and we have a lot of people, um, let's say, around Saskatoon that can maybe get in to the synchrotron. Like Loose Land's only a few hours away. But what happens if you lived out in New Brunswick? It's not exactly as easy to hop in a car and start driving over to Saskatoon. It would take you a while to get here and then maybe four or five or six hours in the synchrotron. Um, but who even gets to see the synchrotron when you're in New Brunswick? Not too many people. The vast majority of schools that they had we're from Saskatchewan, and even if you move up north, you know, some of like Lalosh or something like that, you can go back and forth uh, to Saskatoon in a day or stay overnight in a motel and it's driving a car. But if you're in New Brunswick, you know, you're flying to get here and you're staying, it's a lot more expensive. So we said, isn't there a way that we can somehow do what we're doing for the undergraduates, but do it for high school kids? You know, the Canadian Light Source and the Mad Lab, we're, we're within a few hundred meters. But, you know, as technology gets better, we should be able to, to convey uh, what we're doing here, but to a wider audience. And I thought of it from sort of a standpoint of a, of a science uh, researcher, a tree researcher. And Tracy was thinking of it more from an education coordinator from the Canadian Light Source. So one summer we put our teams together we had the Mad Lab team made up of like people like Zach and Tegan and Chloe here with me. Uh, we're the tree ring lab, we're the people who kind of understand the tree aspects. But we sat down and we had a series of meetings and we developed a bunch of stuff with the CLS education team. Amanda here was kind of put on charge from by Tracy. Anna Maria is also there helping the students. Bernie's the kind of First Nation coordinator for all things from that aspect. They had some summer students, you know, uh, Tyler and Cooper and Jesse. And then there's Tracy, she's uh, more or less the education uh, lead. And then David, he's our beamline scientist. So we all got together and we said, you know, what could we do from a distance? What could we let these kids do that would be beneficial? And from a scientific standpoint, I'm going, it's very, very difficult for me to get time on the beam line. It's actually easier for these high school kids and these other kids to apply for these special things because the beam line that they were using is, is actually made for this. And it's set aside for educational purposes. And even though I help with a lot of education, I, have to, I would have to apply on my own scientist against scientist and people around the world apply for it. So it's very difficult to get time on the beam line. What we did is we came up with kind of a plan. We want to use the tree rings. The tree rings are actually quite good. No matter where you go, someone, you've sat around a fire, you've seen those trees, you've maybe seen a stump and you've counted along how old was this tree, or you know, you're know you with a grandparent or uh, you know around a fire in the summertime and looking at the rings. You know, most people have seen these rings and they all understand that you know each line going back in time is like a kind of a little uh, storyline or a tree, a, a timeline. And year by year, that tree goes, puts a ring on and then goes to sleep in the winter, wakes up the next spring, puts another ring on, goes to sleep, and it marks that time. And so it's a timeline and it's really interesting. And, you know, if you wanted to go from an education standpoint, you could say, well, this is some really good biology. You're learning about plants. You're learning about, you know, the barks and the annual ring and the early wood and the late wood and all these aspects of the tree. If we included something like the soil that they were growing in right there, then just these trees that have to grow in some kind of soil, it's just like your garden. It's just like a plant. It's just like a potted um, something that's growing in your window. You know, no difference maybe from a loa plant in your window to a tree when you want to look at it on a very basic level. As long as the plant is in some soil, it'll incorporate whatever you give it, you know, and that's what we thought we could do. There's so much from the education standpoint with the timelines, and at the same point in time, lots from the biology, lots from the math, lots from the physics, lots from the chemistry. So there's quite a bit we could have done. We also picked Trembling Aspen, and hopefully with this map, 
you know, it's a very common tree for us in Saskatoon. But what this map shows, it's probably the most common tree across Canada. No matter where you go, they're growing, they're growing naturally. And from a scientific standpoint, for me, they were quite interesting because they're used often in remediation. If a, a polluted environment is there, often you use the species populace because they'll take up a lot of these heavy elements, uh, heavy metals inside the soil, and they'll actually help to clean and detoxify much of the environment. So from a standpoint, this is wonderful. I'm interested in how these trees are kind of working and what's the kind of range of conditions that could make them grow and kind of suck up these uh, uh, nutrients or heavy metals or poisons or toxins out of the environment. But I couldn't ask the government to say, give me millions of dollars so I can travel all over Canada and I can get Aspen from everywhere. And then I can come back and then I can wait in line at the, at the tree, at the synchrotron to try to find out. And the answer is, but students could, young kids could. We can say, if you live somewhere in Canada with an Aspen, we can, you know, give you support and you could send your information, sort of a citizen science. We'll teach you how to do that. We'll give you the information as long as you share it with others. If you accept that you can share with others and you can join our club and you share it with everybody else and we'll share it with all the other people that come after you. So we promised that if this program took off, the Mad Lab would do a few things. We'd get these cores back from these school kids. We would take them into our lab We'd ask them for two. One would go to the synchrotron, one would go to the tree ring lab. We would process it and we would measure how old the tree is. We'd start at the bark, whatever year they took it. Let's say they took it in 2020. It would go back in time, 2019, 2018. We'll measure all those rings. We'll give you the measurements. We'll give them back the measurements. It's a wonderful graphing tool. tool. And they can use it in their math classes. They can use whatever. They can see averages, whatever they want to. And then we'll assign that distance to every kind of year. <clears throat> the other thing we said we would do is that if they took these little vials of soil, you can kind of see one here or else some vials here of full soils. They'll send them over to us. We'll grind them up and we'll kind of process them as much as we can. And then here we have these little mounted holders and we'll fill them up and we'll uh, fill them up from wherever you are and that will give us a snapshot of what the conditions the soil conditions are at your site we'll send you a few little vials you'll send us back some things we'll give you a list of things to send back to us and if everybody does it we'll have a uniform sampling across the whole country something that there's no, no hope we could do now, for those of you who've never seen, this is kind of walking in on the, the top floor, not the top floor, but the middle floor of the CLS, the Canadian Light Source. To, to put things into scale, it's really hard in images, but if you've never, it's a bit bigger than a football field and um, it does all kinds of kind of crazy uh, science as we go along here. There's a, an electron gun in the way down in the basement and it shoots up some uh, light energy into a booster ring and the booster ring just spins it around faster and faster and gives it a lot of energy and gets us going almost to the speed of light. So 0.999 of the speed of light and it gets it traveling very, very fast. And once it gets it up to speed, it puts it out into this other ring, the storage ring. And these are some of those things. To me, I always see it as a giant tree cookie lying there with these uh, a light inside these tubes and being bent by magnets and being bent by mirrors and put in there. And then that after, if somebody needs it, they take it off and way in the back there is the idea's beam line. And what a beam line looks like is sort of here's the storage ring here and a beam line is just a straight line of light that comes off at different uh, energy levels. And so there's a whole bunch of beam lines, kind of like a pinwheel coming off of the booster ring. This is sort of a diagram of what's happening. So deep in the basement, they start the electrons, they go up, they add all the energy in this um, in this inner ring that goes through the outer storage ring. And then off of each of these lines come these spokes and these are the individual beam lines. And ideas is one of the beam lines that comes off of that. And it enters in and it's a particular uh, wavelength and of energy level of, of light. 
And then what you do is you take that light and you bombard it on something. Here's all the kind of um, gizmos that David, I was showing you earlier, you know, mirrors and slits and um, pumps. And inside that tube comes the beams of light. And then there's a, to the end station. And the end station is usually uh, where you put in your samples. Um, ideas for those uh, don't know is stands for industry, development, education, application, and students. So students and education have two fifths of the time on this beam line. Again, it's one of the easiest places to get in if you're a student and terribly hard facility to get in if you're a researcher. And then here's what the beam line end station looks like. Very thick concrete walls, uh, um, uh, big metal walls, lead line walls, lots of radiation inside. And so no one gets to go inside when the beams open. It all goes from a control room outside and it's all done by monitors. And the light comes in and then it hits some kind of samples and there's detectors to detect what, what it's hitting. So this is an example of some of the samples that come in. Here's just an aspen coming in from a, a school in Oromocto, New Brunswick. What we're able to do is go in there, oh, the lines moved a little bit, but we're able to go in there and put these little lines on there and measure exactly from one ring to the next ring, where exactly they move, where it goes by year by year as it goes down. And as long as we give David over to Synchrotron the measurements from the bark uh, wood interface, he's able to take that same bark wood interface, start his measurements there, and we're able to match up in thousandth of a millimeter my measurements and his chemical uh, measurements as we go along. This is a rack we've made it in a kind of a 3D printer to hold specific tree rings, and we can just move along there and sample that in the synchrotron. The other thing we can do is take this. Uh, these little soil samples and we put a soil sample in there and this is from inside the uh, control room there's kind of a crosshair where they can move and at that precise location is exactly where the uh, beam will hit very very intense beam but in there then it'll fluoresce and it'll send off signals uh, of what chemicals that it's actually hitting and what collects it is a detector so here's our detector it's a really expensive uh, piece of equipment and it's inside and the beam of light comes and hits at a certain point and it fluoresces or it knocks off um, electrons and this detector is able to see that. I'll give you a quick kind of uh, science tour but this is pretend some element of some sort with a nucleus and all the electrons orbiting around. If you hit it, bombard it with a really strong light some of these electrons will get knocked out of their uh, orbits. And when they do, the detector is able to see that the, the first peak, the Ka peak and the Kb peak, it's able to measure how often it hits something, what direction, what angle it's coming off, and what energy it's giving off. And those things will tell us exactly what element it is. So you can see every time it hits one, it'll count it, and it'll count these things very, very fast and it'll create a peak. And this peak, this is the A peak and the B peak. And these peaks rely, uh, they line up exactly with individual elements. Now the ideas beam line, what can it see? It can read all these elements in the red at one time. So I think there's 18 elements. So things like you know calcium, uh, chromium, magnesium, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, lots of these elements that are naturally found in the tree, but some of them that are found in an environment, especially a toxified environment. If there's too much of something, too much zinc, too much copper, too much chromium, sometimes things can grow. They need a little bit, too much can harm them. So that was our experiment. We're going to send this across the country. Any kids can join. We're going to ask them if they can give it. This is for science. I'm going to try to use this in, as we go off in the future. The um, Synchrotron is going to, the education team is going to use it, and these kids can use it. So hopefully everyone wins. First thing that the, the uh, Synchrotron did then is they made a, uh, a website, a website with data that people can share and go and get some of these resources. So these are more the teacher resources, and then some of these maps to the curriculum. So 
you know, you, you didn't want to interrupt their school teaching. You want to uh, work in harmony with their school teaching. So we went through all the provinces and territories and looked at their curriculum and saw where areas that we could fit with, let's say, the PEI curriculum or the British Columbia curriculum or the Northwest Territory curriculum. And we could give that to students um, or through their teachers and give the teachers the information that might help them um, teach their things at the same time join our program. <clears throat> In the teaching resources, you can see they've made all these modules, you know, from module one, uh, things on background on trees or sampling labs, and then uh, checklists of what if they ordered, what would come in, what the packing sheets would come in and the kinds of equipment. All these different kind of sections, you know, what makes up an aspen, how does it grow? Some traditional stories from First Nations that are from across Canada that we could collect about this. Uh, things like poetry, crosswords, you know, human uh, tools. So all these different other social science and, uh, uh, or natural science, it didn't really matter. We tried to create all these tools that the teacher could use for art projects at the same time as maybe math projects and give them all these tools that they could maybe switch over some of their teaching around this class project that they're doing with the synchrotron. The last thing they did was they, they, they post the data. So when again, the data comes out on the other end, they post it. And so you can see some Alberta data, New Brunswick data, Ontario, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and these are all the sources that are on the data on the website and you can just click and you can share it. They also made a sort of a map. We, we've started it off. We've got some about 30 by now um, that we've done. And every time your school joins, there's some in Calgary, uh, some north of Calgary, uh, some northern Saskatchewan. And I'll, I use this Oromocto because it's the farthest away and it was back in New Brunswick, Montreal, uh, some in Toronto. And as more and more people come, we put up a dot in their map. If you were to click that dot in a map, up will come, you know, the little highlight of Oromocto School. And these samples were collected near Oromocto High School in Oromocto, New Brunswick, traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and Peace and Friendship Treaty. View their data at this location and they can kind of click on that, uh, that data. And now you can think if you were in British Columbia and you want to say, I want to see someone on the East Coast, I want to compare our tree in Vancouver to a tree in Oromocto. They could click that and they could play uh, back and forth with each other's uh, data. They could send an email to the teacher and say, oh, you know, how did it go? And we're using your data and thank you very much. Maybe they have a friend across the country. So these are the kinds of things that we did. In the Mad Lab, we did a lot more too. We actually created a YouTube channel and we created both in French and in English a series of videos to show them how we wanted to do that. And a lot of the schools told us back, we were out in the field and we had you on a phone and we were watching the videos saying, this is what we have coming. This is what's coming, we've ordered. So for example, here's uh, Tegan with uh, the tube that we mail back and forth with the various pieces of equipment that you'd get inside. You know, it's a six minute video, but uh, you could go through. And in this case, we. We dubbed it in French with French talk. So la paquette was the package that they'd get. And that information could go to both a French or an English school. You know, the same video in French and English, here it is. How do you core a tree? How do you decide what an aspen is? How do you do things? There's two people we had in our instructions. We like people to do it with one and the person who is holding, handling the core would have some gloves on. We sent them some gloves and they would put it in our special straws seal it up and mail it back to us. Um, here's the soil pit video. This is how you dig a soil pit. This is how far down you want. This is an A horizon. This is a B horizon. These are our little sample tubes. This is what we want you to write on the sample tubes so that we know. And then you fill out the forms. All really interesting and very simple chores to do. But when you're a grade seven or eight or nine, uh, student across the country. Some of it was, you know, challenging, and but they really felt like they were doing some some science. And they, they used all these videos we created and they're still used today. The core data that we'd come back, we'd again measure it. And then we'd send it over to the Synchrotron one core, we'd mount it. And here's, for example, the spectrum that came back, the energy levels that were bombarded. And if you put this on there, each of these peaks, you can start to see, you know, 
where the like potassium, the cell, the calcium, titanium, chromium, each one of these, we could tell them what it was and where it was and how, how much was it, you know, heavy on the zinc coming in this one. We could go through time and we can actually go from doing this test all the way through time and we could do it over and over and over again through the length of this thing, the various energy levels, the peaks that were coming out. And more importantly, we could put it along with these trees. So this was this tree ring, and this was this tree ring, and this was this tree ring. And we showed them in the timeline as things were changing. We automated this to even show them in slightly different ways where we could have, you know, sort of uh, the photon counts, but again, time is on the bottom here, or, and you could see how some of these elements would change through time. And in this case, I'm gonna stop here, but you can see roughly in 2002, a huge uh, iron peak in this tree. And in 2018, another big, huge iron peak. And the school was able, we were able to give that to them. And they were able to use that information um, to go through time and get something from it. What we also asked them to do is like, look at the soil data and give their soil data. Right away, we see these huge peaks of iron. And again, this is from Oromocto. So if anybody's ever been to New Brunswick or if visited places like the Bay of Fundy, the soils there and the, and, the, and the water in the Bay of Fundy, it's so chocolatey, kind of red, rich, just showing how much iron is in their soils. And they had these big iron peaks along, especially in the water. And it was in all the soils. Everything is so heavily um, with iron. And of course, the trees need iron. When you see the green leaves, that's part of the iron process. And then all the other trace elements that are in there, including some bad ones like arsenic, you know, when there's not supposed to be any arsenic in the tree, but every once in a while you see things like arsenic or arsenic in the soil. That can be natural, but sometimes they can also cross over and get into uh, plant life, which can be kind of um, bad for humans. Again, really no arsenic is good for most humans. And then what we did was we asked them all to do sort of a, a history lesson, if you want to call it research into their community. Tell us what your community is like. We got them to go in and look at their climate because sometimes the trees are changing, especially some of our northern communities. We can see that quite well. And other times you can just go in there, you know, and ask them what happened in your community? Uh, how does it reflect on your data? So they make these timelines sort of for the last hundred years and you know, this is from Calgary, but when they started to build their place, when their school opened, uh, what was it maybe before it was your schoolyard? Maybe it could have been a golf course. Maybe it could have been a gravel pit. Who knows what it could have been before? And then they go through some of the more recent time about uh, their school and reflecting on all their history and the environment that these trees may have been growing in. And then near the end here, we ask them um, to compare. So we'll give them something. And here again, you might not be able to see it, but again, in this 2002 big iron peak and a 2018 big iron peak, and this is our Mukto, and this is their timeline. And what's really interesting is in uh, 2002 and 2018, they had this major flood, pollution up on the land, swept into the water, getting into the vegetation. And this was uh, all that kind of chocolatey brown, red uh, mud that came up and onto the landscape and the trees showed it really well. These are spring floods from ice jams that came up and in that next ring growing in the next season, suddenly you see a giant peak of iron coming through. So whether they knew it or not, they started to have in their aspens almost a flood frequency. So they were able to go to their aspen trees and say, how often did it flood here before we were here? And the trees, if they were there and growing along the, along the Oromocto River, St. John River, um, suddenly they could tell how, how often it flooded. It had a really good iron peak every time that red mud washed up onto the shores and went down, dried, and then the trees started growing later that summer. So very interesting from a standpoint. And I was able to learn that these aspen trees, no matter where, have the ability to take up iron really quickly. So if you dump a lot of extra iron on them, they're able to take that up. And so these are some of the tests that I'll start to be able to uh, experiment with as we move forward and as we start to see what um, the other um, groups start to come along. 
And like I said, up to now, we've had about 30 groups and we were supposed to have quite a few last year, but then COVID hit, of course. And then the synchrotron was down, the university was closed. It was very difficult. And depending on what jurisdiction you were, some provinces were everybody was at home, so we couldn't send out kids. In some provinces, you could send out a kit, but just because you could send it out, it didn't mean that the kids could join up in one big group to go out and collect data. So COVID really put us behind the scenes, but we're still prepared to move forward. We're prepared uh, this fall. We're sending out many kits again, as we're kind of out of COVID or into the fourth wave, but we're having more schools take us up right now. And so hopefully by next spring, we'll have a lot more dots on the map. We'll have a lot more. And uh, the more dots I have on the map, the more um, ecological plasticity, the ability for those trees to see what they can handle in some of these uh, remote locations or these kind of polluted locations that I could kind of see, or in this case, uh, trees that are in a floodplain that get flooded every once in a while. <clears throat> so just in summary, it's kind of a quite an ex uh, exciting project, the Trans-Canadian Research Environmental uh, Education Program, the TREE program. We send these uh, pictures out and they send us back pictures of when they're sampling. Here's something from Northern Saskatchewan again. But it, for me, it's wonderful to see these young kids go outside. And just like when I was a kid learning that you can learn outside and you can get your interest in something like a, a subject like forests or trees or plants, you, you know, especially for these young boys, as a young boy, I was terrible in school in the sense that I sat there bored out of my uh, skull all the time. But if you would have asked me to go to the forest, I would have been so happy to go and to learn and to take part in these kinds of things. And it took me forever to get going and to really find what I love or at least take what I loved and move, turned it into a career in education. So I love it if I can pass it on and I get pictures of this with kids smiling and they're out in the forest. The other thing that I can honestly say is that like in this example here, this teacher, you know, he got so much out of this, passing along the education. Each of these kids working on that project, whether it's here in Saskatoon or off in their own school in Alberta or Nunavut or uh, Prince Edward Island, where, wherever they happen to be, it's a little bit different they feel like they're adding to something in a bigger picture. Uh, they're working with the synchrotron, one of the biggest and best pieces of scientific equipment we have in Canada. And even Tracy, you know, she does this all day for a living with group after group, but she's always got a smile. She just loves, and I, I personally love it too. We take so much energy from these kids, whether we're on a Zoom meeting, uh, communicating them with them on a Zoom meeting, or we're sitting there uh, around a table with them, or if they're able to visit. Some are still able to visit, but we can reach out so many more people now with our technology, our Zoom, like right now, and um, reach out across the whole country to get kind of uh, uh, inspired by them, but also inspire them with what we do and the kind of research that we do. Last, I'd just like to thank some of, thank some of our uh, people. We worked on a lot of modules that had First Nations, and uh, we had some really wonderful elders who shared stories with us. And so we want to thank them in all of our modules every time. And the pre tree program is actually sponsored by Promo Science and NSERC Promo Science, uh, as well as Canadian Light Source and the Mad Lab. We all put a little bit of funds in. And so we have our own website there, the tree at lightsource.ca. You should be able to find us on Google. And that's about it for my for my talk tonight. <clears throat> I would love to answer any questions you have. Uh, am I back? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that was so uh, that was so interesting. <laughs> I mean, to see the excitement, uh, the students uh, learning, and uh, your your involvement with them. And uh, I could see why you uh, were awarded a mentorship award a few years ago. And, uh, and as, you, as this article on, on uh, University News said, you uh, apply your, your background in uh, Métis community of, uh, of uh, instruction uh, involving people and community. And 
it really excited me because I uh, love trees and soil and uh, never had that kind of uh, opportunity. But, but when I joined Soil Survey, for instance, and, and did have that, started learning that, and I said, why can't the farmers be here when we're doing this? Why can't we involve the community, like, you know, in this, yeah. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful when you can, you know, when you get so uh, invigorated by their enthusiasm, but you just want to often pass it on, you know, and passing it on is, I guess, the trait of a good educator or something. Somebody who wants to share that knowledge so much that uh, it makes people excited to, to learn. So I guess all the comments on the Mad Lab page about you uh, being grouchy, I, I seem to be quite facetious uh, comments. <laughs> well, some days, you, before my morning tea, maybe, you know, like we, we tend to have a lot of fun with each other in the Mad Lab. So, yeah, for sure. Now, generally, Aspen, it's always fascinating me because, I mean, in the prairies, you can get these little gnarled Aspen, like, but 10 feet high you know, growing on a scrubby hillside and then you go up north and you get these aspens just towering up straight up. I mean, it seems such an adaptable uh, tree. Uh, well, it really is. And, and because of that, it's either boring because it's so common or else to me, it's actually so exciting because it can grow anywhere, you know, even on a mountainside or uh, very cold locations and like, uh, around Yellowknife, I've sampled a lot around Yellowknife and all the aspen up there, and uh, you know, it's so adaptable. And I even worked at a at a spill in the Sydney tar ponds, you know, and that's what they used, you know, aspen and other populist species to try to take some of these uh, chemicals out of it. And they do a wonderful job. They're still thriving and happy, uh, growing well, but they're just taking all these toxins out of that environment. And you know, it just shows how. Uh, dynamic nature is I guess that you're right they can grow on all these little places and all kinds of growth forms to them and uh, they're, they're a super interesting species in my mind and they remind me of home you know like a, a prairie boy a Saskatoon kid you know nothing like that first color of aspen leaves in the spring they have that kind of a beautiful yellow green and it's just probably one of my favorite moments to be in the forest and watch it and then again like today some of the beautiful colors you see as they're starting to turn and um, you know getting ready to go to sleep for the winter that's my favorite color too that uh, new green of poplar aspen leaves uh, so uh, is there any questions from other people like yeah i i am totally fascinated with the crooked trees and so i'm just wondering is there something different in that soil that you found when they were doing those that sampling you know what the students um actually did find something really interesting but like most science they they found out one thing and asked about it, about four more questions so what they did is they sampled on a straight tree um on a various places like near branches and all these things and then they went to the crooked trees and they started sampling them right where they started to bend and do a lot of weird things and then they compared one to the other and what we kind of found out is that in their tests is that on the crooked trees um, there was a chromium deficiency. So they had, there's a little bit of chromium in the ones across, the nice straight ones. And uh, the soils there had chromium in it. And as soon as you moved across the road and that by that soil, they had very little chromium. And um, in fact, hardly any, depending on where you sampled. They, they did four or five places where they sampled soils. And wherever the, 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 the crooked part of them kind of hooked, then they saw that there was no chromium in there where there should have been. And so they thought it was gonna be that it had something extra, but it turned out that they it looked like they had something that they didn't have, like they needed. And by that lack of chromium, it may be the answer to why those trees were crooked and the ones across the road were straight. But they didn't sample that direction. They sampled looking for what did one have that the other one didn't? And, and it turned out one didn't have something that the other did. And so they designed more or less in their heads a new experiment that now that I know that, I would go back and redesign something and design it a little bit different. But it was quite interesting. And again, it threw them for a little while, a day or two, when they were looking at all their information because they kept uh, you know, looking for what was, was not at the crooked bush. 
and it turned out or or you know like or what did it have what did what was at the crooked bush sorry that was right. making these trees go crooked and then it took them a while before they realized maybe it's what it, they don't have and that's uh, you know you see that in some plants like oh tomatoes in gardens or something if something's deficient suddenly tomatoes will maybe crack or do something or get a different disease because they just don't have what they need to fend it off and so it's common enough in plant science but for this science club they weren't thinking that way and it took them a while to find out and so they said yeah maybe some group in the future that the next loose land science club will apply for this uh, this um, time in the synchrotron and maybe they could design their experiment a little bit different and um, maybe find an answer. Right. So still a mystery, but that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It's like anything else in science. It's um, they've added another piece to the puzzle and the whole puzzle isn't there yet, but it gets every piece kind of gets you a little bit closer to where it was. And, uh, you know, obviously there's things like genetics and all kinds of things that could happen there too but it's just not something that they studied and I haven't studied that much myself. Yep. Also super good to have kids get involved in science and have a feel for it and trust it. So there's so many people now that just don't trust science and to have a better feel for how science really works and what kind of answers it really gives. and how you can put your faith in it is really good right yeah. from the early stage i, I can't can't agree with you more and the ones that actually um i guess warm my heart more i have a twin daughter so you know those young women coming up that i see um you know we're underrepresented in science so much by women and when i see somebody you know they're such good students and i, I just hope that they keep going forward and i see that i always try my best to make sure that those young women are in there so that when my girls get a little bit older, they're the ones who are kind of being taught by their peers of, of women and you know, some wonderful scientists there. And I just hope again, um, every time I meet one of these young women to that they go on and really do, um, you know, set the bar a little bit higher. Yep. Nice. So when the new classrooms come on board, do they take photos of what their Aspen Bluff area looks like when they send in your tree ring samples? Yeah, we give them quite a bit of uh, direction, like they have a form there. And again, you could go online and look at it. But um, we ask for the longitude and latitude uh, down to like a pretty intense place. So we can go and look at their site um, on Google Earth nowadays. You could just go there and visit. And um, uh, it helps us sometimes because, um, you know, when they have problems, we can see it. You know, we can kind of say, oh, you know, uh, is this truly an aspen you know and i said well then they'll send me a leaf and they'll text it to me and they're live you know in um, some place in the province like nova scotia or whatever and they'll text me and uh bam all right you know the leaf will come up and i say oh that's the wrong it's populous but it's the wrong one you should be a little smaller and then they can walk over and how's this one we have two okay that's one you know and then send a picture and so these things can come at almost any time and um nowadays even if they have uh, the teacher has a good, you know, uh, cell phone plan. They um, what do you, uh, FaceTime. They, they do FaceTime a lot sometimes, and they're in the field with these kids. And the only time I ever get to meet them is when they're actually in the field and they have a question for us. So they FaceTime us, and then um, they send it off. They mail it. We mail it to them for free, and then we give them postage uh, return envelope, and then it gets uh, sent back by courier to us. And so it costs them nothing. And then we get them, we process them every couple of days of when they come in within a couple of days. And sometimes they want to, especially if it works up, we either record what we're doing for them or they want to watch it live and ask their questions live. So again, just an iPad on our side and we can FaceTime them or Zoom them. And then we can say, this is what, you know, Chloe's doing right now. She's getting paid $10 an hour to do this, but you know, this is your sample kind of coming in, I guess, or whatever, 15, whatever minimum wage is more or less for a student, but she's getting paid, but this is your number. And they go, hey, yeah, there's my writing, you know, and they see their samples and they see them being glued in. And the same thing can happen at the Synchrotron. Uh, David can go over and say, yeah, I'm loading up your samples on his phone. And then he shows exactly. And then he goes, I got to close the door and the big buzzers go off and you're inside the chamber kind of thing. And then he goes back around and he shows them and 
um, none of the equipment move, the light doesn't move and the detector doesn't move, but the stage, we can move it back and forth, uh, up and down, you know, in sort of X, Y, Z dimensions and we program it all. And then the kind of computer runs it at a slow rate across and we collect all the data. Nice. Yeah. So historically there was mile long grass fires and uh, trembling aspens because they are clonal species. They were able to survive these grass fires. You said the floods are easy to detect in the tree rings. Are, is there a good way to detect when their trembling aspen bluff is subjected to bigger and smaller fires? Um, sometimes there's a nutrient flush with that. The hard part about them is that the aspens usually grow to that sort of an old, old aspen is 80 to 100, 120 years about as old as we can. And a lot of the fires came before that time period. And so sometimes there's no trees that are around when they were kind of burning. But we have done a couple of tests on um, other species, especially with forest fires. And again, we see a nutrient flush right after lots of nitrogen is going on and lots of uh, new nutrient availability. And it gets washed through and we see the flushes of nutrients coming right after the fires. And the trees, the survivor trees are usually really quick to pick it up and take the kind of that nutrient flush that's coming out, especially things like nitrogen that come up and um, that get liberated in the soils. We see that more in our some of our tests from our northern uh, groups who have got maybe um, a lot more fire activity in the boreal forest, let's say, or else we've had a few groups from the mountains that have sensed that from the interiors, interior B BC, sorry, things like that. Not always with aspen, but we've seen it in a couple other species. And again, most of these groups that are sending it are uh, school groups. And so they don't usually have a place to go out that's on the edge of town. A couple of them have like Humboldt School sent one and they were, their schools around the edge of town and they had a golf course that used to have Aspen Blush Bluff. They cut it down and, and then there's some Aspen trees right beside there. So they add a lot of fertilizers to their uh, golf courses and the Aspen seem to be showing that. So that's one of those ones that's on near the edge of town. But most of the school groups just kind of can walk a few blocks away to go sampling. And in most cases, there's some aspen around their school, so it works. Thank you. That's really interesting. You're welcome. Any other questions? We're coming up to uh, about an hour, and uh, this has been such a exciting uh, uh, presentation. And your your love for your uh, your field and for people really really makes it uh, heartwarming, as you said earlier. I felt that. Um, and I guess you're on uh, for another program this week, Julie. Do you want to fill us in on that? Because you set it up. Oh well. When we contacted Dr. Uh, Colin Larock, he said that he was involved in a couple of programs and, and whereas the TREE program had been around for a little bit longer, the Shelter Belt program was um, a little bit more recent. And because we were focusing on National Forest Week and we found out that um, since the PFRA was established that the number of shelter belts has declined rapidly. So we asked um, if he would mind uh, talking about that as well and what can be available to agricultural producers. Did you want to add anything more, Colin? Um, I'm still getting ready. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, we've worked with shelter belt trees and PFRA and various other uh, researchers for about 10 years. And uh, what we started really concentrating in the last few years is uh, the carbon, the carbon that these trees sequester, um, not only in the trees above ground, but trees below ground and then in the surrounding soils. And we're getting into that really interesting time now politically, and there's an only even election tomorrow where our federal <laughs> election, our federal people say, yes, carbon is worth something, and here's a carbon, uh, this is what carbon costs, and our provincial government is on the other side of the coin saying, let's not go there because it's so detrimental for farmers. But our research shows that, you know, actually it's not as detrimental as, as you say, if these farmers have shelter belts growing, they're sequestering probably more carbon than they're wasting um, through their fuel and all that. Just give them a credit for what they're already doing 
and uh, we can easily measure that. They're already growing these trees. And um, so it comes down to maybe a bit more talk on some carbon, but also what we've done is we've developed a tool. We've worked for about a decade. Uh, we put together all of our information into an online tool and to show people if you want to plant more shelter belts, this is how you do it. This is how much it'll cost. This is how much carbon you might be able to sequester. And if you have an existing shelter belt or shelter belt trees, this is how you can measure them. This is how much carbon they are. This is how much money they're worth. And if you cut them down, this is how much money you can lose. And so it all comes down to that whether carbon is seen as a good thing or a bad thing. And if you put a price on it, um, again, we'll, we've created what we call a decision support system. We're not trying to tell you what to do on your land. We're trying to give you the information so you're better informed before you make a decision to either plant or not plant or harvest or tear down some of these shelter belts, what you're actually doing. And this summer with our big drought was one of the great years where we got to see the benefits of those shelter belts and those who took them out saw the benefits of, uh, or that they lost, you know, when they lost all their soil moisture. So lots to unpack and uh, I'm gonna show you our tool and talk about that uh, project for that we have. Thank you, that was a good summary, thanks. We're finding the same thing out at the afforestation areas. We have the wetlands of the West Whale joining the North Saskatchewan and the South Saskatchewan River. And so because of that glacial spillway, there are still uh, remnants of the uh, glacial river. And the afforestation areas being planted with trees, actually on the advisement of the PFRE out there, those wetlands are still doing fairly well this year. Whereas all the surrounding wetlands that are still in the either agricultural land or on the CN land or by the 11th Street landfill, those are dried up totally this year. So it's only the, the wetlands that are surrounded by trees that are surviving. So that was a really very evident uh, uh, the fact that it was showing for us. Yeah, that's a wonderful example. Right. Anything else, Julia? But uh... I can't think of anything. And okay. yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time and expertise and uh, your love of uh, of uh, of this um, learning. Yeah, and sure. sharing. Uh, I, I really felt to move by tonight, and sure. I'm sure everyone did. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and and tell other people about uh, the upcoming uh, event on Tuesday evening. Look forward oh. to it. Yeah, 